you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, this is Voss here from thechrisvossshow.com, thechrisvossshow.com. Welcome to the big show, my family and friends. We certainly appreciate you guys coming in and being a part of the show. Thanks for tuning in, as always. We really appreciate it. We've got an amazing uh, author on the show today. We're going to be talking about his newest book about Shakespeare. And so we're going to be talking some Shakespearean language here. Uh, uh, I, I am trying to pull uh, Shakespeare jokes. Oh, Horatio, I knew him well. Was it Horatio? No, it wasn't. It was some other guy, wasn't it? Anyway, we're going to be uh, doing some Shakespearean stuff on the show. I feel like I should be talking in Shakespearean speak, but uh, I know of none. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Anyway, guys, refer the show to your family, friends, and relatives. Make them feel guilty that they're not being as educated as you are, because God knows that joining the Chris Voss show and listening to it is kind of like a mini cult MLM religion, but not. There's no taxes. There's no tithing. There's no. There's no. Uh, there's no suicide things you have to participate in or blood rituals. It's just kind of a fun thing to listen to and laugh to and become smarter. So therefore, refer the show to your family, friends, and relatives. Goodreads.com for Chess Chris Foss. YouTube.com for Chess Chris Foss. And uh, LinkedIn.com for Chess Chris Foss. And the videos are starting to take off over there on TikTok. Go to Chris Foss One on TikTok and the Chris Foss Show on TikTok. We're trying to be cool which is uh, not working out. No, I'm kidding. Actually, the videos are doing really well. Uh, so go check all that over there, folks. But remember, even though we're not an MLM, you need to have five friends and relatives in your downline you're for the show to. No, I'm just kidding. There's no requirement for that. I'm just guilting and shaming you for whatever grift I can get off it. Uh, today, our amazing author has written the latest book that just came out April 18th, 2023. Uh, the book is entitled Stalking Shakespeare. A memoir of madness, murder, and my search for the poet beneath the paint. Wait, is this a book about me? Anyway, Lee Durkee is on the show with us today. He's going to be talking to us about his amazing book. Uh, he is the author of the latest memoir uh, described by the New York Times as wickedly entertaining. Oh, this is stuff we love on the show. Wicked entertainment, uh, which you can also find is the name of my OnlyFans. Uh, no, I'm just kidding, people. Uh, it's about his 20-year obsession. He should seek help with trying to find lost portraits of William Shakespeare. His novel, The Last Taxi Driver, was named the best book of 2020 in Ireland, France, and America. Does anybody care about Ireland? No, I'm just kidding. That's a wonderful thing to get. Ireland's a wonderful country. Oh, we just lost all two people that are over there drinking. Uh, and his stories about essays and uh, have appeared in Harper's Magazine, The Sun, Oxford American Zotrope, Garden and Gun, Tin House and Mississippi Noir. He lives in North Mississippi. We won't hold him that against him. Welcome to the show, Lee. How are you? I'm, I'm happy to be here, Chris, and I'm doing well so far. There you go. And I'm just kidding about North Mississippi. It's a wonderful place. I've never been there. You know, Mississippi will conform to a lot of stereotypes, I have to admit, but um, it's a little bit different than you expect as well. There you go. Yeah, it's I'm in the middle of the field in North Mississippi right now uh, in a cabin as stereotypical as you could imagine. Wow. Do you have those beautiful trees and the, the kind of bogs that are there that I've seen in the pictures? I've got a lot of hummingbirds and just like a delta-like field of flatness surrounding me. Oh, well. And it's, so, a, um, it's a beautiful it's countryside. A beautiful yeah. Yeah. As long as you stay away from anybody who, uh, you know, looks like they're from the movie Deliverance, you're okay, I think. It's hard to do that here because, you know, we inspired those people. Those, those characters are probably cast from Mississippi. Well, I think you have to go to Arkansas to get that. Anyway, now that we've uh, alienated all two Arkansas uh, uh, listeners, uh, I, I don't think they have internet out there, do they? No, I'm just kidding. I love my Arkansas Sinians, whatever. Uh, so let's get to your book. Uh, well, give me a dot com. <laughs> give me a dot com uh, of where people can find you on the interwebs. Uh, LeeDurkey.com is the easiest place to go. Um, 
You can also go visit my blog at, um, it's called Curious Portraits of Dead Elizabethans. Mm. It was kind of the genesis of this book was an addiction to the blog and it's still up after God knows how many years and reincarnations. Um, and I'm on, well, I just got off Twitter, um, but I'm still on Instagram and uh, where I'm famous as a hummingbird feeder, not as a writer. Oh. Yeah, oh, I, I get a, a lot of hummingbirds. And um, someday I hope to be as famous a writer as I am a hummingbird gatherer. Well, there you go. You got your book out. This is your first, no, this is your second book, correct? Third book. Third first book. one was, first one was published in 2000, got rave reviews. And then I went 20 years before I published another book. So I would been in the wilderness a long time. Well, it's a good thing you didn't wait another 20 years to get your third book out. Uh, so. Yeah. Give us the 30,000 foot overview of your newest book, Stalking Shakespeare. Well, I had a good Shakespeare professor as an undergraduate at, guessed it, Arkansas. <laughs> and uh, and um, he got me inspired to learn about the Elizabethans. At some point, I wanted to put faces to names and I took started taking home books of portraits. Mm. And I realized that most of these um, courtiers were unidentified. And so I took up the strange 19th century hobby of learning how to identify unidentified courtiers and portraits. And this in turn led me to Shakespeare and that rabbit hole. And um, once I started investigating Shakespeare's portraits, I just started hopping scandal to scandal to scandal. Every portrait associated with, with Shakespeare, said to be Shakespeare, painted from life, was just mired in some curatorial scandal involving portrait switchery, strange, inexplicable behavior, and even murder. And so um, I became hooked, addicted, obsessed with finding um, the first, to be the first person to find a portrait of Shakespeare painted from life. And Wow. Um, now you and, have on the cover of your book uh, a, a, what I think most people think of when they think of a portrait of Shakespeare. And then it's kind of scraped. So tell us about that. Well, that is um, a rendering of the Drew shoot engraving um, made from uh, that was in Shakespeare's 1623 first folio, which is the sacred book that stopped so many of his, uh, it's his collected plays mm -hmm. and it deified Shakespeare. And this, and the engraving was the only bodified, we know vouched for portrait of Shakespeare and it made him mm -hmm. less than handsome. Mm. Um, and um, so a search was on, it was assumed that this engraving was made from a portrait painted from life. And so for 400 years, people have been searching for this portrait and I joined that search. But um, I concentrated on the uglier portraits that had been neglected because the Drew shoot engraving was far from handsome. He had bug eyes and <laughs> the giant forehead and he, he looked diseased and uh, he didn't look healthy at all. So I concentrated on the uglier portraits, figuring Shakespeare was getting more beautiful by the decade. And these other portraits, the homely Shakespeare's were being neglected. Yeah. Like what's going on? That's a, uh, you know, maybe he just got a, maybe he just got some uh, bad light that day, or maybe they got his, uh, his bad side of his face. I, I, that's, that's one thing I learned in Hollywood being a, you know, from my friend, Brad Pitt, who calls me all the time for tips on how to look so ridiculously good looking um, is you have to have your, you have to use the right, you know, whatever's the best side of your face. I don't know what that means. Um, so uh, now it's built as a darkly humorous and spellbinding detective story that chronicles your search for an authentic portrait of William Shakespeare. But there's something deeper here about this story. Kind of give us a little bit of your origin story and, and how you got on this pathway to where, uh, you know, uh, Shakespeare needs to get a restraining order from you for you okay yes well i stocking. got married i got married suddenly and moved to vermont and then was divorced even more suddenly and um now, did she divorce you because you were uh you were a little obsessed to with shakespeare and not her no this was pre-shakespeare she had other reasons oh, okay. oh, equally okay. valid but, All right, okay. well, just but the, sure. the important thing was that i was divorced not why <laughs> and um I found myself as a misplaced mississippian having to spend the next 18 years until my son was ready to go to college or not, stuck in Vermont and dealing with seasonal depression. Mm. I did not embrace winter in any way. I stayed indoors. And um, and that's when I got addicted to this search for Shakespeare, because right at that point, the Internet was coming to life. And suddenly there were these online galleries 
that gave us these portraits that had been hidden in storage containers for centuries. Nobody wow. had ever seen them before. And suddenly everybody had access to them. So I knew I had a huge advantage over anybody else in terms of finding a legitimate portrait of Shakespeare just due to technology. Mm -hmm. And there were other technologies I embraced, such as getting curators to x-ray and infrared portraits so we can see their entire histories. Um, we can see everything that's been censored. We can see the carbon underdrawings, et cetera. Um, and I became very good at getting curators to spend a lot of money to test their so-called Shakespeare portraits. Wow. And, and I mean, I, I guess why, why was, why is this so hard that, uh, that, uh, you know, to, to find an accurate picture of him? Why is it so hard? Well, because they keep getting debunked. I mean, there are oh. always this portrait being offered up, you know, every decade, every century, you know, it has a reign of a half-life and this is Shakespeare painted from life and everybody oh. believes it and embraces it. And then it will be debunked. And sometimes the debunking is fascinating and scandal filled, but the debunking nevertheless takes hold and a new portrait, even more handsome is suddenly presented to us. The same process repeats itself. Shakespeare gets handsomer and handsomer. I don't know if you've seen the most recent portrait of Shakespeare embraced by the Stratford Birthplace Trust, hmm. but he looks like a soap opera doctor now. And, you know, I call him Spongeworthy Shakespeare. And that's what people want. Shakespeare. I mean, I'm old enough. I remember when musicians were ugly, but oh. our culture, our culture wants handsome artists now. That's you true. Know? Yeah. And as a writer, that's horrifying because there's this youth cult tied in with MFA programs and all they want is young, young, beautiful authors on jacket photos. And the same goes for Shakespeare portraits. They want beautiful Shakespeare. I was having an argument with somebody the other day, I believe it was my mom. And she was like, uh, you really need to add your portrait to the back of the book. And I've been losing a lot of weight. I've lost a uh, hundred pounds or so. And uh, uh, I, I'm, I've still have more to lose. And I'm like, mom, I, I have radio face. That's why I do a podcast because I have radio face. And uh, I'm like, I, I don't want to scare people away from buying my book. But maybe I'm hoping that someone will do a revision like you just mentioned to me and my face in the future where they'll be like, hey, we should get some AI to fix this ugly old man. <laughs> It'll help move product, I bet. You know, yeah. uh, it's certainly what publishers want. It will help me on TikTok too, because uh, I see what I'm competing with over there, and it's really about the image that you make over there. So there you go. So I mean, this this becomes like a whole obsessive journey that's decades long for you. Like uh, it's almost like uh, becomes uh, an obsession and hobby. How many different paintings or pictures did you go through to try and find this, or were you able to count? I don't think I could count. The problem with the book was narrowing it down. Mm -hmm. um, if you go to my blog, which, you know, Curious Portraits of Dead Elizabethans, you'll see that the, the portraits I've explored are endless wow. um, and psychotic. Um, and there are so many of them. And I was discovering, you know, portraits I was, was hoping were lost portraits of Shakespeare. And I explore those as well. So um, wow. certain portraits lend themselves to the book better than others. You know, if you have a lot of side-by-side -side comparison or video animations, you can't use that in books. So you have to cut those no matter how much you love that portrait or in enamor are in enamored with it, it doesn't make the cut for the book. Um, the, a certain type of portrait that can be logically argued comes to the forefront when you're selecting which ones go into the book. Now, couldn't you just check Shakespeare's Instagram account? A lot of people take selfies on their Instagram account. I, that has not crossed my mind. It would have saved me a lot of trouble had I had I thought of that and, and if that works. Yeah. But, um, he probably does have an Instagram <laughs> account, I assume. Well, I mean, doesn't everybody? I don't know. Welcome to 2023 and Gen Z. So this is very interesting. Tell us about the places you go because... You went around the world, it seems, to to uh, hunt these down. Tell us about that journey. Well, the the book starts in Vermont, which is really the the genesis of it. Seasonal depression and you know the great comedy that comes out of it, you know the desire to for oblivion and suicide. Uh, it's always been fodder for me for for comic writing. 
Um, when I leave Vermont, I go on a visiting artist fellowship for seven months to Tokyo. And there I encounter um, broadband internet for the first time. And I use the broadband internet to basically steal um, portraits offline and collect files on different portraits because the most difficult thing you're up against in this endeavor is finding high resolution photographs which are guarded religiously by uh, museums and institutions in Great Britain. Uh -huh. So it's, it's no easy task to get a good photograph of a portrait you're interested in. And I stayed in Japan and had a wonderful time, fell in love with the culture and I, I write about that. Um, it's one of my favorite parts of the book. I, and I, um, after that, I go to Mississippi, um, which um, I fled Vermont in my during my 18th winter. Uh, I couldn't stay there another moment. I love Vermont. I admire it. The people there are, are amazing people. So much to admire about them. But they don't get your jokes. They're very literal minded. And um, the weather is just too brutal. So well, that, I fled. That, that explains that Bernie guy. Yeah, yeah. He used to be a regular customer of my customer of my, my oh, really? clothing store. Oh, yeah. Did he always yeah. did he, he actually, always he bark at you about the one percent? The one percent. Well, he's been doing that forever, hasn't he? Yeah, he hasn't changed his tune much. He um yeah. he helped me get a friend of mine out of prison in Kathmandu. Well, he that's didn't have good. to do that. Yeah. That's so good. hats off yeah. to him for that, right? And um and um I fled Vermont back to Mississippi. Um back to Oxford, Mississippi, which is not my hometown. I'm from Hattiesburg, which you've never heard of and nobody else has. But um, um, from there, I ranged out to the Volger Shakespeare Library in Washington, D.C. to explore. They have the largest collection gaggle of Shakespeare portraits in the world, I assume. And um, they also have a trustee statement saying that none of these portraits will be x-rayed unless there's a public outcry to do so. And so... Wow. It, um, the Volger Shakespeare Library is an amazing facility. I love it. They've been very kind to me, but I've been battling them for, for many years now to x-ray their portraits and they just won't do it. So it's frustrating. And there's a very controversial portrait there called the Ashburn portrait, which um, their behavior with has been somewhat questionable. I write about it in depth in my book and, and um a lot of time, I've spent a lot of time in DC. And then I finally, eventually towards the end of the book, go to England and visit all these portraits I've been looking at online all for the last two decades. Oh, wow. So I'm looking at the Ashbourne portrait and uh, some of the history behind it. Now, what does the X-raying the portrait do? What does that do when they do that? Uh, what, what's well, the purpose of it? If you imagine, I'm going to say this without pontificating, but if you imagine a book, say a book of Macbeth, and you can look into that book and you can see all the drafts that led up to the final product. And you can also see everything that's been censored from that book in an age of censorship. It gives you an idea of what spectral technologies allow us to do with portraits. Mm -hmm. um, when you X-ray or infrared a portrait, you get different effects. If you infrared a portrait, it gets absorbed by the carbon underdrawing. So you get to see the actual first draft sketch, if such a sketch exists, oh. which to me is fascinating. Yeah. Right? You know, um, X-rays allow you to see under portraits. They allow you to see what's been touched up, what sometimes what's been censored. Uh, you can see what's underneath the paint, unless it's been overpainted with a lead heavy paint, in which case, you can't get underneath the paint, which can be very frustrating. Um, mm -hmm. So um, you can see every draft. You can divide the portrait and um, see its entire history through through these uh, X-rays, infrareds, uh, pigment analysis, um, ultraviolet uh, examination, dentrochronology. You can see how old the panel was that it was painted on. Uh, most of these portraits were painted on panels, not canvases. So oh. it's almost limitless, and I'm sure since I was writing these books, that the technologies have graduated and moved on well beyond my comprehension. There you go. So uh, does does it uh, does it do any damage to the thing? Why are they usually resistant to having their... It shouldn't. Increase? No, the resistance is financial. But I think the resistance oh. also has to do with um, underfunded 
museums quite often, but I think there's also a protective um, aura around Shakespeare in England. Nobody really wants you looking beneath the paint of Shakespeare. Um, I did have, I talked one curator into x-raying a portrait. He promised me he would. I guess he experience difficulties getting that done because mm -hmm. it can cost thousands of dollars to just transport a portrait that's 400 years oh, old. Oh yeah, you know, that's insurance and all that and, stuff. And what he did, and I'm not going to name names because he should not have done this, but he took it down to a local clinic and had them x-ray it there. I couldn't believe it. When he sent me the x-ray, it was completely unprofessional. And it was showed just a bunch of bones and stuff. Clinic everywhere. And I thought, showed a bunch a of bones in a kidney. Clinic? Yeah. <laughs> And, um, you know, and I'd waited years for that x-ray, and it was just oh, so disappointing God. to get this shoddy x-ray that didn't show anything after years of waiting. But that's part of the book, too, is anticlimactic results are part of it, you know, um, and part of the depression, too. It's, is part of the fear, maybe, on some of these uh, organizations that the, the painting might get debunked and therefore the painting would lose value? Or, you know, people you would, would think so. And I think, I think that's obviously the case in some portraits. Mm. Um, but then again, when you have the Vulgar Shakespeare Library, they've debunked their two most valuable Shakespeare portraits. Wow. So go figure, you know, they're either how, how to make sense of that. Uh, that seems to defy logic, but they have done that wow. um, either to their credit or not, because one of the debunkings was highly controversial. Mm -hmm. And the other one still has advocates that disagree with them. And um um, but for the most part, they don't want you looking into Shakespeare. Mm. And um, and nobody wants to be the pariah who raises the wrong questions about Shakespeare in England. It's not career ending, but it doesn't really help you, I don't think. And anyway, curators, curators don't have the time or energy to be passionate or obsessive about one portrait. But evidently but, you were. Yeah, but I'm not the head of the orphanage, and they That's are. True. The curators are in tar charge of the entire orphanage. They have all these charges, whereas I can obsess on one portrait for a year and then obsess on another portrait for two years and da 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 da. They don't they don't have that luxury. So I have a yeah. lot of sympathy to them. And um they all hate me, and I have sympathy for that too. I completely take up too much of their time. I pester them with questions endlessly. Um and when I began, I was a complete idiot at this. And I, the questions I asked were idiotic, therefore. And, uh, you know, over the years, I got better and better at it. And I became expert at costume dating and things like that. Mm. But um, it took me a while, a long time to win over the confidence of any curators. And fair enough, they're overworked and they had better things to do than to respond to a cab driver in Mississippi. There you go. Well, there's there's some controversies around Shakespeare. We had uh, Michael Blanding on the show years ago. He wrote a book, North by Shakespeare. Maybe it was a year oh, really? ago. And, and uh, there's some claiming that maybe there was a bard who wrote most of Shakespeare's work and uh, Shakespeare regurgitated some of it or reworked it or re-put a thing right, on it. Right, yeah. have, you, have you heard about that? Yeah, I read that book. Oh, did you? Yeah, yeah. We, we had him on the we we had uh, the I think in the New York Times or Washington Post author who wrote the book about the original data that was uh, done, and man, he said the hate that he got from you know you mentioned earlier the uh, scholars and stuff that mm -hmm. back up Shakespeare, he got a lot of hate. I think he got some death threats too. Like they <laughs> he pissed off uh, the wrong crowd, which is kind of weird because normally you have to go on YouTube or Twitter, TikTok to do that. <laughs> There is a there's a lot of anger associated with Shakespeare. And what's odd is it comes from people who have nothing invested in Shakespeare. They don't read him. They don't pursue his films or plays. And yet they vehemently do not want to hear anybody question his identity, yeah. which is an odd reaction. Um, my Maybe book, the problem is it's just too soon. I think that's changing, <laughs> though. I think that's changing pretty rapidly as one generation of white male scholars is being replaced by scholars who are not, who are neither white nor male. Yeah. And they have a very different agenda and a way of looking at things. Um, and I think the circle of white male, alpha males surrounding the Shakespeare myth is about to come down and things are already changing drastically. So um, it, it'll be fascinating to see how it evolves. Yeah. I'm a neutral, I'm a neutral. I'm not against the authorship debate. I find it fascinating 
but I don't see any smoking guns. I well, think it's still fun. a debate. Yeah, I think debate's so much, fun. I think someone should still check his Instagram account because, uh, I mean, the truth might be there. Unless he's got pronouns, you know, you never know. I don't know what that means. Uh, <laughs> so this has been pretty insightful. It's a, it's a build as a fun read, uh, darkly humorous and spellbinding detective story. And uh, you, it, it's interesting all the stuff that goes into, you know, some of these old portraits, 400 year old portraits and trying to nail them down. Uh, anything more you want to tease out of the book before we go? Well, I just like to emphasize that it is a fun read. Uh, it's mm -hmm. not self-serious. It's not scholarly. And what it does is punch up. It punches mm -hmm. up at institutions and scholars who have been knighted. And um, it tries to bring a little humility to history, I would argue, um, that we are not all knowing when it comes to Shakespeare and that it's fair to question who he is and what he looked like. Um, I, in writing it, I took the role of the fool, and the fool mm. punches up, and as long as he makes the king laugh, as long as he makes the king think, the fool doesn't get beheaded. There you um, go. As you long as that happens, with, he doesn't get beheaded, right? Right. You mentioned the review in the New York Times earlier. Now, half of my book, or a good portion of my book, is ridiculing the Shakespeare tourist industry. Oh. So, yeah. So who do they give my book to review in the New York Times? Oh. The artistic director of the Globe Theater, right? Oh, wow. Had I known, I would have changed my name and dove underwater for 20 years. But huh. he loved it because I made him laugh, right? And I made well, him think you, you know, bad um, news or good news, it's all good PR and bad PR. It's all good PR. That's what sometimes what some people say. That's what they know. say. But so far, it's been all good. Uh, there you and go. we've got the... The Times on our side and the Washington Post. I thought they were going to crucify me because I make fun of the Vulgar Shakespeare <laughs> Library. But they loved it even more than the Times did. So um, it's a fun read is what I'll emphasize again. And yeah. um, and I promise you, you'll never look at Shakespeare the same way again if you read this book. There you go. Well, that's that's the most fun thing. And, and it's good to debate these things. We need a... We need an environment that debates and questions and, you know, what ifs and stuff. And comedy, of course, needs to make a comeback. It seems like people take everything a little too seriously and their feelings, uh, they're always getting their feelings hurt. And really, comedy is such a great way to to really kind of look at some of the fallacies and issues that human beings have. And it's kind of a nice mirror that goes, hey, maybe we're not as perfect as we think we are. At least some people think they are. So there you go. Uh, thanks for coming on the show, Lee. Give us your .com so people can find you on the interwebs, please. Um, LeeDurkey.com. Um, LostShakespearePortraits.com. That's the only places you can find me as of now besides Instagram and um, Facebook, of course, because I'm, I'm that old. There you go. Get on uh, TikTok and uh, make people uh, go off over there. They love doing that you know, on TikTok. I if I do go on TikTok, it's just going to be with my hummingbird videos. And, yeah. and um, yeah, I've, I'm already dominating Instagram with them. So I, I really yeah. don't feel the need. You know what you could I'm, do? I'm you thrilled could... to be off Twitter now because that's just too traumatic. Yeah, it's it's kind of gone down. It's been downhill for, I don't know, 10 years, but now it's really off the rails. Uh, and from what I understand, it's going to get worse. Um, it, it's just, it's a trollville. You know, YouTube turned into trollville years ago. I'm surprised uh, lately. I've gotten a lot of positive comments on my video and it seems to have turned a corner. Uh, but it used to be just people that was just trollville for sport. But, uh, um, yeah, what are you going to do? Uh, you know what you should do? You know, it'd be really funny. You could do like a PR video and you could like make like a fake painting of, uh, Shakespeare, eh? Like, don't do the real ones uh, unless you got good insurance and, and lawyers. But, you know, you could you get like a fake painting and you'd be like, hey, you know, what I do with my book. I poke holes in, in pictures of Shakespeare. And you could do the whole Steve Wynn thing that he did once uh, and jam pens into into photos and pictures. Yeah, if you read about that, no one gets that reference. They'll have to Google it. Uh, so anyway, Lee. Just some ideas there for you on the TikTok. Uh, thank you very much for coming on the show, man. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Chris. It was a pleasure being here. Had fun.
There you go. Thanks for tuning in to my audience. Go to goodreads.com for just Chris Voss. You can see all the brilliant authors over there, plus the Chris Voss Show ports all of its podcast episodes there. Uh, you can go see us on LinkedIn.com for just Chris Voss, YouTube.com for slash Chris Voss. Why is LinkedIn over there and YouTube's over there? I don't know. I just made it up. Uh, you can go to TikTok at Chris Voss uh, 1 and uh, what is it? The Chris Voss Show at TikTok as well. Thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe and we'll see you guys next time. I mean, I hope we'll 